Yeah, so hello everyone and thanks Holger for the nice introduction. Um, as Holger said, today I will talk about mineral and climate controls on timescales of soil carbon stabilization in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this project is part of my PhD in which I'm interested in identifying, uh, finding and identifying uh, factors like mineralogy and climate, but also land degradation that influence carbon dynamics on a broad spatial scale. And with carbon dynamics in this context, I mean, on the one hand, how much carbon is stored in the soils, but also for how long this carbon stays in the soil system, because this then can tell us also, as Shane showed, um, how stable this carbon might be to changes. And this will be the focus of my talk today. So when we talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, we know that this region faces major environmental and social challenges due to projected uh, population growth, but also due to projected climate change. Mm -hmm. And this is also what you can see on this map, which I extracted from the most recent IPCC report, which clearly shows that across Sub-Saharan Africa, we will see an increase in temperature already by the end of 2050, and also an, uh, an increase in extremes like drought and aridity, but also heavy precipitation. And all of these changes, of course, will also affect soils. And in order to understand associated changes in, for example, carbon sequestration, we need to know the factors that control, on the one hand, how much carbon is stored in the soils, and also for how long this carbon then stays in the soil. So looking at the timescales of carbon stabilization. And before I will show you some of uh, some results of that, um, let me just briefly give you some numbers why we should also really consider uh, salts not only from temperate regions. Um, so current estimates suggest that um, in the first five centimeter, uh, there are about 25 petagram of carbon stored across Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is more than twice the global annual CO2 emissions. Um, and I just, pulled out these numbers to show again that even though quite often it is still assumed that tropical and subtropical salts do not store that much carbon, which might be also true under certain conditions, but also given the large area they are covering, there's actually a lot of carbon stored in these salts and we really need to better understand the mechanism and processes behind it. Um, when we talk about uh, controls on carbon stabilization, of course, there are already a lot of studies that try to look at the factors um, and quite often climate and mineralogy um, are uh, found to be really important in controlling these carbon dynamics. Um, and when we uh, talk about mineralogy, it is important to know that um, there are different minerals in the soil depending on the weathering status and that these minerals can have um, or that they have different properties that influence uh, how they interact with organic material. So for example, um, in intermediate weathered soils, there are usually quite a lot of poorly crystalline minerals, which are also known as short range order minerals, which can, for example, be extracted by oxalate, aluminum and iron, but also two to one clay minerals like smectite can be put in this uh, mineral group. Um, and due to their uh, large surface areas, they are quite reactive and therefore they can, uh, or thought, it is thought that they can absorb quite a lot of organic material and therefore protect, uh, protect this carbon from further decomposition. Um, in more highly weathered salts, uh, we find quite often a lot of crystalline clays like kaolinite, so one-to-one -one clay minerals, and due to their structure, they are thought to interact less with organic material and therefore also stabilize less carbon. However, these findings are mostly based on local gradient studies from temperate regions, and it is not that clear if these findings are also true on a much broader scale and also for subtropical and tropical salts. And also given that how those gradient studies are usually designed, it is not that easy or yeah, not that easy to also look at the interaction between climate and mineralogy across different climate zones. And for that, uh, we use a systematic continental scale approach to study carbon stabilization mechanisms at a large broad space, at a large scale, but also and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 
So in order to do that, we use an already existing data set, which comes from the Africa Soul Information Service. And in my, in my work, I'm using a subset of this uh, large soul survey. And in this map, uh, you can see um, the sampling locations indicated by the black circles. And in the background, you see um, the main climate zones of Sub-Saharan Africa. In total, we have about 500 soil samples that are clustered across 30 sites. And we always have two depth layers. So the top soil layer goes from zero to 20 centimeter and the subsoil layer goes from 20 to 50 centimeter. And during the field campaigns, um, they also collected information about the disturbance of, of the sites. So we have information about uh, any signs of erosion, but also if there's any kind of cultivation um, happening at the site. Um, the colleagues who collected all the samples, they also did a lot of um, soil measurements and I'm just focusing on a few of them here. So one is of course the soil organic carbon content, uh, but also the amount of oxalate extractable metals. So um, aluminum and iron, which are a proxy for short range auto minerals or these polycrystalline minerals. And also the clay content, which is also quite often used as a proxy for carbon stabilization. Um, what we added to the data set are the radiocarbon measurements. And as Shane nicely showed, um, radiocarbon measurements of soil samples, especially if you only have a bulk soil sample, is, it is not that trivial to directly use. And unfortunately, given the large scale, I do not have that many um, measurements over time as Shane has, um, but there's still a way of calculating a mean carbon H. And in my case, I used a simple one per model to get this mean carbon age, uh, which gives you an idea of how much time has passed since the carbon was fixed from the atmosphere. But it is also important to notice that this is really a mean value because we know that there is carbon of different age in the soil. So we have, as Jane showed, fast cycling carbon and slow cycling carbon, um, which I cannot uh, separate from each other. And this is why this gives you an idea about the mean carbon age. And lastly, we also have X-ray powder diffraction data, which we use to quantify the different clay minerals in each soil. So we know the concentrations of two to one clay minerals, so smectite, and also one to one clay minerals like kaolinite. Um, in terms of hypothesis, um, I, I divided my talk into three main areas. So one will look at the effect of climate. And they are assumed that higher precipitation results in overall higher carbon inputs and therefore also younger carbon ages because also the conditions, for example, for microbial activity are uh, uh, ideal under these uh, humid conditions and the carbon gets decomposed relatively fast. Um, in terms of mineralogy, I assume that salts that are dominated by two to one clay minerals and or poorly crystalline minerals um, can stabilize carbon over longer periods and have older carbon ages compared to salts that are dominated by one-to-one -one clay minerals. And last but not least, I also looked at the effect of uh, anthropogenic factors, um, namely the effect of cultivation and erosion. And um, these salts are disturbed in multiple ways. And I assume that they have older carbon ages compared to non-disturbed salts. So let's have a look at some of the results, um, just to give you an uh, idea of what kind of, of those uh, timescales we're talking about, so to say. So when average, averaging all the samples I have for Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, I get a mean carbon age of about 180 years in the top soil and about 560 years in the subsoil samples. Um, and these numbers might be a little bit abstract, um, but in a global context, these numbers are one to two orders of magnitude lower compared, for example, to calculated mean carbon ages for boreal regions. And what you can also already see is that the subsoil samples have overall older carbon ages compared to the topsoil samples. And this is also a quite often observed pattern because 14C is uh, strongly depth dependent so the deeper you go in the profile, the older the carbon usually gets. Um, but let's have a more detailed look at the data distribution 
So in this figure, you see on the y-axis, the mean carbon H, and on the x-axis, the soil organic carbon content. And the color refers to the um, different climate zones. And what you can see is that the mean carbon H is decreasing with increasing soil organic carbon content. Uh, um, so the higher the soil organic carbon content, the younger the mean carbon H's is. And in these regions where we have young carbon H's and high soil organic carbon content, we find mostly soils from humid regions. And in contrast to that, we see that uh, older carbon H's are uh, uh, found in arid regions, which also have then lower soil organic carbon content. <laughs> and that salts that come from um, seasonal climates, that they are somehow in between and also sometimes a little bit off from this overall pattern we see here. Um, when we look at the subsalt sample, first it is uh, important to notice that the y-axis is on a different scale, but besides that, you see that the pattern between mean carbon age and soil organic carbon content is actually quite similar and that the main difference is the difference in carbon age. And this is actually true for all the factors I tested. And therefore, I will only focus on the topsoil samples for the rest of my presentation. Um, so let's have a little bit more detailed look at uh, some of the effects um, that we can see in terms of carbon age when we look at the entire data set. And for that, I use the principal component analysis. Um, so you see all the um, variables I used to derive the principal component analysis. And then I colored the soil samples according to their climate zones. So the climate zones were not used to derive the principal component analysis. And it can give you an idea of how well the variables are explaining um, the climate zones, so to say. And um, what we can see is um, patterns we would expect, so to say. So, uh, for example, we see that salts um, from humid climates um, have high concentrations in one-to-one -one clay minerals and high values in gross primary productivity. So this is an indicator for yeah, highly weathered salts where we also find um, tropical forests, for example. Um, on the other side of the uh, climate, we see that for some of the arid sites that they are characterized by relatively high concentrations in quartz. And for, the, uh, or for some of the seasonal climates, uh, seasonal salts, we see that they are characterized by high concentrations in two to one clay minerals and also poorly crystalline minerals. Um, I also did not include carbon eight as in the principal component analysis, but I'm able to add uh, the carbon age to the to the plot to see how well the variables are actually describing um, the carbon age and also with which uh, variables the carbon age is um, correlating. Um, and you can see not all of the variation of carbon age is described by the variables, but that was also not the goal of my uh, work. But you can see that it looks like the carbon age is uh, correlating with some of these reactive uh, clay minerals. Um, and by just looking at these patterns we see in the principal component analysis, the question of course is, um, can we identify some more specific uh, controls when we look at the different uh, climate zones, which uh, as shown here have quite distinctive um, mineralogies. Um, and this is what you can see on the slide. So on the y-axis, we see the mean carbon H again, on the x-axis, the soil organic carbon content, and the color refers to the oxalate extractable metals, so the short range order minerals. And in this panel, um, you, I'm showing you only the data from the arid samples. And you see that overall the concentrations in oxalate extractable metals is relatively small. Um, but we see that there's still a strong relationship between mean carbon age and soil organic carbon content. So the higher the soil organic carbon content, the younger the mean carbon age again. And this to me indicates that these salts are probably carbon limited. And as soon as carbon is entering the system, it also gets decomposed relatively fast because there are no minerals that could stabilize this carbon. When we look at the other climate extremes, so um, the humid sites, 
we see that they already have a higher concentration of oxalate extractable metals, um, but they also have a much more uniform distribution in mean carbon H and soil organic carbon content. So overall, they have relatively high concentrations in soil organic carbon content, but the mean carbon H is relatively uh, young. So this also indicates that the carbon is leaving the system relatively quick and that there's probably not that much uh, mineralogy involved in stabilizing the carbon. And the pattern looks quite different when we now look at the intermediate uh, weathered salts, so um, the seasonal climate zones. For example, when we look at the temperate regions, we see that samples that have a similar carbon content um, usually have older carbon ages with higher concentrations in um, oxalate extractable metals, which are indicated by this uh, bright or yellow color. When we look at the tropical side, um, the pattern looks quite different, but I think it's still pointing in a similar direction. And it also shows that, they, that within one climate zone, we can still have a lot of different mechanisms occurring. Um, so for example, when we look at the right-hand side of this um, shape, we see that samples that have higher concentration oxalate extractable metals tend to have older mean carbon ages. And when we look at the um, and when we look at the other side of the shape, we see that these samples again do not have really high concentration oxalate extractable metals, and then that the and then that the relationship with mean carbon age is probably driven more by um, carbon inputs again. Um, another important aspect of um, carbon stabilization by minerals is the uh, clay fraction and also the clay mineralogy. And quite often the clay fraction or the clay plus fine salt fraction is used as a proxy for carbon stabilization. So it's assumed that the higher the concentration in, in the clay, of the clay fraction, uh, the more stable is your carbon. So the older the carbon can't, uh, the carbon age. Um, and in this panel, I'm showing you all, uh, samples that only have one-to-one -one clay minerals. And what you can see is actually that there's no strong or no relationship at all between the mean carbon age and the clay um, plus sine silt fraction. But there's also no strong relationship between the concentration of one-to-one -one clay minerals. So the darker the points, the higher the concentration in one-to-one -one clay minerals. And you can see for these samples that they uh, all have relatively young mean carbon ages. Um, and when we now look at salts that have two-to-one clay minerals, we see again that there's no strong relationship between mean carbon age and the clay plus, plus fine salt fraction. But we see for samples that have a really high concentration in two to one clay minerals, that they tend to have um, older mean carbon ages. And this already brings me to the summary of the key findings, which I try to summarize in this um, triangle here. So on the one hand, um, we find younger carbon ages in Sub-Saharan Africa um, in humid climate zones where we have high carbon inputs, but low mineral carbon stabilization because these salts are dominated by one-to-one -one clay minerals. And in contrast to that, uh, we find older carbon ages in two different climate zones, uh, but for different reasons. So on the one hand, we find um, older carbon ages in dry climates where we have low carbon inputs, but also low mineral carbon stabilization again, because these salts or yeah, most of these salts are um, dominated by quartz minerals, which are not known to interact much with organic material. And we also find older carbon ages in humid climates uh, where we have again, high carbon inputs, but also high mineral carbon stabilization because these salts that are then dominated by two to one clay minerals um, and also show a higher concentration in these oxalate extractable metals. Um, I did not talk about the anthropogenic factors much, and I'm happy to discuss this more uh, if people are interested. Um, but I can tell you that for erosion and cultivation, there was no um, consistent pattern at this large scale. So we we saw a signal 
coming from erosion and cultivation and um, in the mean carbon age. So usually these disturbed sites had slightly older carbon ages. But at this large scale, it is also not that easy to exclude other co-founding factors that come with erosion and cultivation. And when we looked at sites where we had erosion or eroded sites next to non-eroded sites or cultivated next to non-cultivated sites, there was actually no clear pattern for the different sites. And before I uh, finish my talk, I would like to do a quick yeah, thought experience and try to put these findings a little bit more into context. So what does these numbers and these patterns we see at this large scale, uh, what do they tell us also when we think about climate change? So in this map, um, you see the predicted changes in climate zones by the end of the century. Um, the gray area um, refers to the regions where we have, uh, under the current climate conditions, um, high potential for mineral carbon stabilization. And the color indicates uh, the predicted changes. So yellow means that this region um, becomes more arid and purple and green means that this region uh, becomes more humid. Um, and the orange color refers to any kind of other predicted changes that are happening um, outside this gray area. And you can also see that most of the changes are actually happening within this uh, gray area where we also have the highest amount of carbon stored at the moment. And when we now think what will happen if the climate conditions changes to the soil and to the uh, system at all. Um, so on the short term, um, the carbon input will probably decrease because the vegetation will react relatively fast to changes in climate. But on the long term, the question is how and also on what kind of timescales the mineral phase will react. Because under the current conditions, um, there are a lot of reactive minerals present and they probably will not change their properties when it becomes more dry because they need moisture to weather. Um, but then these salts might become carbon limited due to the decreased carbon inputs. And then the question to me is if this now under the current conditions stabilized carbon may then get decomposed because there's just a higher demand for carbon or if it will be still stabilized by these minerals. And in contrast to that, if we look at um, the salts that become more humid, um, I think two, so on the one hand, the carbon inputs will probably increase because again, the vegetation will react relatively fast. But the question is again, what will happen to the mineral phase? Um, and I think there are two potential pathways that could happen. So on the one hand, with increased moisture, there will also be an increase in uh, weathering. So primary minerals will then probably also weather to these reactive minerals, which then can maybe stabilize more carbon. But of course, the two to one clay minerals, for example, they will also weather to one to one clay minerals with increased moisture, which will then store less carbon. So there, to me, the question is which of these weathering processes may happen faster and maybe also the dominant one. And of course, um, these, the mineral phase will react on a much, much longer time scale, but I think it's important to keep those changes also for the mineral phase in mind, and maybe also to do more experience and model exercises that will allow us to better understand what kind of processes will happen on which time scales. And with that, I would like to finish my talk and thank you for your attention.